are done dreaming of winning four championships in a row. We're gonna live it. This is our house. Let's defend what is ours. girls, the Gym Dogs are in the business of delivering championships. Okay girls, can you be great tonight? Can you dig down deep and give it a little bit more? Can we be perfect? Hello, well, welcome back to the skating lesson, Suzanne. I've never had you on video before, but you're sitting in your beautiful backyard and you just retired yeah. again for the second time. Suzanne, why did you retire? The first time or the second time? <laughs> now, Suzanne, we now. were just getting back now. to you coming back. You were just starting to get your outfit game going. I thought <laughs> you were giving us some good heels. Why the retirement? You no, know, it was really rough because I got rid of all my red and black suits and, and most of my outfits when I retired because I wanted to wear different colors. <laughs> so I had to go buy all new ones. So that was a little uh, a little bit of a challenge. But yeah, I you know, I think just because Courtney and I agreed to two years. I mean, that's what we agreed to when she first asked me uh, if I would work with her for a bit and just get her started and give her some advice and mentor her a little bit and work with her and guide her and so we agreed on two years. And so when the two years was up, the two years was up. And um, it wasn't like a long conversation, you know, where I said, oh, I want to stay. Or she said, oh, will you stay? Or mm -hmm. I said, what do you want me to do? It was just like, you know, we just we just knew we talked about all year that, you know, when when the season was over, I'd be finished. And we just proceeded that way just based on the plan. Well, what are you going to do with all your energy? Because you've got <laughs> a lot of energy, Suzanne. I've well, never actually, known yeah. if you'd be home for a night. So. <laughs> I know, I'm busy, busy, busy. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm hoping to build a sports complex in Athens with my daughter, oh. my son-in-law. So yeah. yeah, we're working on plans. We've been working on them for a while. So a little bit of that. Um, also going to be a resource for Courtney, of course. Um, I'm always going to be a, a fan of hers and a fan of Georgia Gymnastics. She asked me to be the president of the Legacy Club this year, which is the alumni organization, which is really like my main thing anyway, are all the alumni. I have really made it a priority in my life to continue my relationship with all of them. So, And I'm also going to be working back on the board with the Tenno Club. Okay. So a lot of development stuff, fundraising, some promotions, some marketing. I have some ideas. Uh, along those lines, but no coaching. Okay. Well, it seems like there have been a lot of changes in the coaching ranks over the last two years, especially now. Miss Val just retired from UCLA. Chris Waller is taking over. Courtney McCool and her husband are going to Utah. What are you thinking of all the changes so far? Wow. I love it. I love it. First of all, I love change. I don't think you can grow without change. And so I always encourage young people, you know, if you have an opportunity, do it, you know, do it. That, that's what I did when I was 30 years old. I came down here and saw an opportunity. And the minute I walked on campus, I knew this is where I wanted to be. And, and I think people need to be willing to do that, to take a risk and, and to basically uh, accept the fact that there's no such thing as failure and live that life, which is what I think is the best way to live. So um, I love that everyone's moving around. I love the young people in the sport. We need more of that. Uh, I can remember when I first got the job at Georgia, one of my first competitions, of course, were at University of Florida. And I love Ernie. And Ernie and I became, you know, Ernie Weaver and I became very good friends. But I remember watching her and saying, you know, I am not going to be 60 years old running around with a ponytail and tights in the gym. <laughs> it needs to be for the young people. And uh, so when I si turned 60, I got my hair cut. Yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, I really, I really think it's for the young people. And although I think experience is very important in coaching, certainly there's tons of things I can add, or all of us that have been in the in the field for a long time can add to any program with our experience. But still, I think it's the young people that can really motivate, and the ones that can really relate to what other young people want today in their sport. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about the 
you know, it's always been UCLA, Georgia, Alabama, Utah. Do you think the powers are going to shift at all over the next couple of years? I mean, Oklahoma is so strong now. We saw Denver doing better. Do you see that kind of changing with Jordan Weaver in Arkansas? Absolutely. I think it's going to change everywhere. I mean, I really feel like Kentucky is just a program that I've watched the last two years. Um, and I've really been impressed with them. I've really been impressed with the coaching staff, um, their calmness, their quiet calmness. Uh, but they get right down to it. You can tell they're working really hard. Um, unfortunately, some of the teams in the West Coast I don't get to see uh, as often. So I don't have as much of an opinion about them as I do uh, the SEC, of course. But uh, I love I love what I see at Kentucky, especially on Denver. Oh, my gosh, yes. They were incredible this year. I was so glad to see them in the Super Six – or the Final Four, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm, still the, I'm still in the old world. <laughs> the final four they were a team that just got better and better as the season went on and they were consistently getting better and never really faltered in the last third of the season and a very deserving team to be in that final four and they held their own there and i'm sure they'll be back there soon hopefully georgia will be too <laughs> well let's talk about georgia what is it like being led by courtney she was obviously your athlete you have a long history together and now she's in charge and you're not in charge and there are a lot of people that didn't believe that this could ha i've read that that you're the puppet master. I've read a lot of things, Suzanne. So what is it like being led by Courtney? Well, um, the first year and the second year were very different. The first mm -hmm. year, definitely I was setting the pace a lot more. Um, first of all, we lost Charlie, you know, one of our assistant coaches in January. So we were short an assistant coach. So of course I had a lot more to do with the workouts and what we were doing and the periodization and the training to peak at the end of the season, uh, skill selection and composition and just workouts, um, mainly because Courtney had never done that. So I definitely was more involved the first year. The second year, uh, Courtney made it very clear that she was in charge and she wanted to run things her way, do things her way and learn from her mistakes. So I stepped back a good bit and she made some mistakes, but she learned a lot from them. And, and that really is the best way to become a better coach is to make some mistakes. Um, she definitely is her own person. There's no question about it. Even from the minute she took the job, she let me know and Josh know that she was in charge. She wanted our ideas and we were going to be a team. But she was going to be making the decisions and she made them very, very, um, a little bit, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to get her to make th decisions a little quicker, you know, probably somewhere in between me and Courtney is where it needs to be. I'm like completely spontaneous and sometimes I need to think longer and sometimes she thinks too long and loses the moment. So somewhere in the middle is probably ideal. And I think because we work together. Um, that we were able to see that somewhere in the middle, middle really is the best. And I know with my coaching staff, I loved having different opinions. I loved that Jay Clark challenged me all the time. We got into some real rifts over it, but he made me think. He made me go home and think about what I was doing and if it was really the right way to go. And I, I really believe I gave that to Courtney. I challenged her and made her think. And even when I agreed with her decisions, I said, well, what about the other side? Because I, I think it's very important to look at the other side, especially when it involves decisions that are directly um, affecting the athletes. Uh, so it's a little hard for me at times, you know, a little hard for me at times. I was the lead on floor and I would sometimes, you know, be telling the girls what to do and she'd come over and go, no, 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 see, I, I, no, I don't want them to do that. I'd be like, you need to tell someone else what they need to do. <laughs> I, got, I got a little rift a couple times, but, um, Nothing big. I mean, we got along great. I think the world of her. And one of the things that I really learned about her is I, I believed when she got the job that her experience would, her experience as an athlete, as a gymnast, not only in the Olympics, but at the University of Georgia, where she was on four national championship teams, that that experience would be the kind of experience that many other coaches don't have. And that that is just as valuable uh, to the athletes as a coach that's coached 30 years in the college realm. So uh, that is true. That's exactly what happened. The fact that she could go over to bars and has done every single skill any one of them have ever done, and she could really talk to them about how it feels and, and what do they see and relate to them when they just had, you know, a horrible day in classes and were just exhausted. And because she was has been there, she could read the atmosphere. She could read the, the athlete's a down days. And she responded very, very well to that. She was very accommodating to the athlete's needs. And I think that's what a good coach does. Mm -hmm. And I really saw her grow in that area a lot. Okay. So where do you think George is going and how do you assess the last, you know, couple of years? The first year, seventh at NCAAs was huge, mm -hmm. a surprise. Mm -hmm. This year, regionals was fantastic. And then nationals was not so fantastic. You know, what do you think happened? Well, the first year, we were completely the underdog. No expectations, really. 
five people on an event the majority of the year, on two events the majority of the year, and five five people on bars at the championships. We had so little to lose that we just went for it. It was like the olden days of being the underdog, and the underdogs are the ones that are going to creep up and bite you in the butt every single time. And that was our team. We had so much fun. We had so much team chemistry. We had we had uh, just so much camaraderie. Everybody worked, and and everyone really competed at their highest level. They reached their full potential as a team. And we went into the national championships, and we did as well as our RQS, which as a coach, that's always been my goal, or NQS now, that's always been sort of my objective is to score at least that at championships, and probably three to four tenths higher is, is really what the aim is. So um, it was a great year. This year, of course, we had a better team. We had a little bit more depth. We definitely had six on vaulting and floor all year. Um, not a lot of depth on bars. Um, but it was disappointing. It was disappointing, not just at the end, but we never really got into a rhythm of consistency. We'd have a great home meet and then not so great an away meet, a great home meet and not so great an away meet. So really what happened at nationals was really uh, not a surprise to me because we'd sort of been going that up and down route the entire season. Um, we could have rolled the dice and could have had a great meet at nationals, but we had never gone you know, back to back to back meets uh, well during the entire season. So, I, again, it wasn't really a surprise to Courtney and I, although it was a disappointment. Um, we, we saw a team that I think the expectations just were too much for them. They, you know, because we were seventh the year before, we're like, OK, you know, let's do this. And then when we saw our draw and we thought, OK, you know, if we can beat Denver, we can make it into the final four. And we thought, OK, we're pretty even teams. Um, we think we can. And of course, we talk that talk. I mean, we believe it because I, even if you believe something, you don't accomplish it. To me, that's that's better than not believing you can get there at all. So we did believe it. We believed that we could make it to the final four. And um, we just we weren't there mentally. We weren't there mentally as a team. Um, we even in practice, we would have one great day and then one horrible day where we'd have three out of six people fall on bars. The last month of practice, we had three to six people, three out of six people falling on bars every other day. And I can't even remember a day when we had a bar team that couldn't hit bar routines at the end of the season. So, you know, there were a lot of mental errors, a lot of mental mistakes. Um, you know, I really just after the short time that we were with these girls and with nine freshmen, it's really hard to get a pulse on exactly uh, what happened. I don't think necessarily anything went wrong. I just think our expectations were a little bit high for um, having so little leadership from upper classmen um, and you know, you need a culture. You need a culture. And we just don't have that yet. It's going to take, you know, one or two more years to get there. And those nine freshmen to be seniors before we're really going to have a culture of winning and of um, performing at our best at the end of the season. How much did the lack of buys affect you? Because it seemed like at nationals, it was going well on bars. Marissa had a mistake. She got a 10 at regionals. So we know that she could have scored very well. And then it kind of felt like it snowballed. You know, it went from bars right. to beam, then Sydney had an uncharacteristic mistake, and then it all kind of fell apart quickly. Well, you know, you don't want to, it's, it's not because of any one person, but I think mm -hmm. leaving bars, whenever you leave bars on, so, uh, leave an event on a downer, you take that with you to the next event. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really why I'm not a fan of, um, um, what are they called when you add somebody into a meet? A substitution, um, alternates. Exhibitions, yeah. I couldn't think. No, I'm a fan of exhibitions because I feel like you have momentum at the end of an event and you have some of your top girls at the end of the lineup and then you build that going into your next event. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we didn't have that momentum coming on to beam. And although we are an excellent beam team typically, um, we, we were shaken when we left bars. We didn't have a bad bar score, but, you know, we had one of our top kids not hit. And just the whole kind of feeling of, oh, no – just kind of came over us. I think everyone just sort of felt that. And um, it happened to us at SECs as well. The same kind of thing. We, we were never a bounce back kind of team this year. We were a team that got momentum at the beginning and could keep it going. And if we had momentum at the beginning against a top team and it was close, we were going to beat them. We were going to beat them. If we, were, if we were marching forward, nothing was stopping us. But when we hit a wall, we just could never get around it. And, and again, I feel like what happened at Nationals happened all year and and really in practice as well um we only had six girls on bars the entire season so we we didn't have any alternatives or any other ways to really uh get the competition up on that event where the athletes really had to perform in practice to continue to compete and so that allowed for a lack of discipline on the uneven bars that i think just 
carried over into the championships. You know, at the beginning of the year, you were showing that competition on bars. You were posting those lineups and who was For ranked that? where. Yes. How yes. much did that lack of competition hurt you throughout the season? And not it, having. It always hurts. It always hurts. It's it's always best to have competition. And we, we tell all of the athletes, you know, even if you're not competing, you're pushing the ones ahead of you. And we do rankings and we, we, we believe that the girls sh should know where they rank, they should know where they stand, and they should know what they need to do to move up into that ranking. And they should have to perform in a competition to be in the next competition. Um, but when you don't have all, you know, when you don't have a deep lineup, it's very hard to really um, have any benefits from that kind of a philosophy. Um, but in the fall, you know, Megan wasn't hurt. Mm -hmm. So we had Megan, you know, Megan was on bars and Emily was on bars, Emily Shields. And so losing two of our top bar workers really impacted our lineup on that event. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do rankings like that, how do you keep it so that it stays positive and it doesn't get negative? So that there's not, you know, bitter feelings and people that are getting upset? Or is that just a reality and something that works itself out throughout the season? Well, it happens. I mean, it happens, especially with freshmen. And, you know, there's always this little chatter, chitter chatter uh, between themselves with the athletes. But Courtney's great about communicating with them. In our Monday meeting, she says, you know, this is why we do it. This is why we're going to do it. This is, you know, we want you to know where you stand. We don't want any surprises. We don't want anybody to be upset or disappointed. We want you to know where you stand the whole time. And we keep the rankings each week and we put, do a, a point system to them. And the rankings are just for the first competition. They're only for the first competition. And so, you know, the girls that ha have the most points compete in the first meet. And as the season goes on in the fall, as we get closer to November and December, and we start having inner squads in December, those, those inner squads count for more points. So clearly it's more important what you do in December than what you've done in September. But, um, you know, we had athletes that um, were, were ranked at the top in September and were still, you know, in the, in the top six by December. They might have dropped to fifth. They might have been first and dropped to fifth, but they were still in the lineup because they accumulated so many sports points early on. It also gives our freshmen a, a little bit of an incentive to come in in shape. Uh, we want everybody to be in shape, ready to go, because we believe in a lot of time off. We think rest is critical. And um, when they come in in shape, you don't have to practice as much. And um, it's, it's always been my philosophy to give the team off Wednesdays and the weekends. And, you know, Courtney tried very hard to continue with that practice as much as she could. Now, are the girls still off now? Or are they getting back in the gym? What's the status of that? Uh, Emily and Marissa are here. Emily, by the way, is working her tail off. I mean, she is bound and determined. She's going to be better than ever next year. And she's about a month ahead of schedule uh, with her knee injury. So um, obviously, bars will be first for her. We need her on there because bars is still going to be our weakest event in terms of depth this upcoming year. Um, so a couple of the girls are here. I think Alyssa's here, the, the local girls and Marissa and Emily are moving into a new apartment. So they're excited and they're up here getting settled. But all of the girls come back July 1st. We all start training in July. Uh, they teach our camps in July and start training and school starts here, you know, August, I don't know, 8th, 9th, 10th. So, uh, they all will take class in July. Now, what do you think is going to be key to moving bars, you know, forward? I mean, it's capable of being a good event. Will we see Courtney coaching on bars? Because that was her event as a gymnast. I mean, we know all the tens she got, all the titles. And what do you right. expect there? Right. Well, Courtney's, Courtney was Courtney because of her mind. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from her physically, but there's a lot of athletes out there that are physically extremely, extremely talented. Uh, but Courtney just, she had the strongest mind. She had the most mental toughness of anyone I have ever been around. I mean, just clearly at a completely different level. Um, I don't know that you can coach that all the time. Some of that's just DNA. Uh, there's certainly tricks to and tricks and, and not just tricks, but, you know, things you can do to increase mental toughness and mental training. But uh, she just had it. She had it from the beginning. I think she'll do more what she did this year. She did a lot of just from event to event, moving around a little bit. Um, Josh will be the bar coach again. Uh, you know, he has such tremendous experience coming from Chow's and he's great with teaching skills and he's a great technician. Um, still only being two years into the college scene, um, the training and preparing for a college season is something that's still relatively new to him. And, and that's where Jason and Courtney will come in even on bars, um, with the actual training schedule, mainly because they have more experience with that. And we did find that that was a uh, one point that needed to be addressed before this year was just the discipline and the training, the, the number of hits, hit routines, the statistics needed to raise up over there in bar training. So I'm sure that Courtney will be paying attention to that, but she's the beam coach 
and the head coach. And so she'll be a, a little bit of everywhere. Um, Jason will be taking on a lot of floor, you know, just like most vaulting coaches in the country. They do a good bit of the tumbling, too. And um, so we'll see what else she does with staff. I'm not sure if she's going to bring in a voluntary coach or not. Now, we talked about, you know, the difference of how Courtney's mind was so strong. What do you see the difference between this team and the teams that you coached? Is it a physical difference? Is it a mental difference? You know, what is the difference between this team and... Having a culture. Mm -hmm. It's all about having a culture. And, you know, when, when and I'm, I'm sure KJ can talk to this point, when you've had championship teams, multiple championship teams, you know, you're validated already as a coach. And when a freshman group walk in and there's three of them or nine of them mm -hmm. and they're sitting there talk, and you're talking to them as freshmen, you, you know, you can say... This is how it works, and this is how we do it here, and we know this works. And you can say that. You can say that because you have championships, because you've had success. Um, and, you know, we have the, the most individual national champions in the country. I think we still do. Um, and we've always had the most All-Americans. I think we still do. And we've had a lot of individual success and a lot of team success. Still, the record was 16 SEC titles and 10 national titles. So, um it, whatever I said was validated by the statistics and the culture was sort of an unspoken culture. Um, the upperclassmen knew how it worked. They knew what we did with team building and team chemistry. They knew how important it was to respect one another and they handled it. They handled the team. They handled their business. There was very little that I had to handle because the upperclassmen just brought the younger girls into the, into the routine and it just flowed like that year after year after year. Um, so I think it's just part of it's going to be time. Part of it's going to be us getting some of those top recruits. You know, obviously Georgia, uh, wants to, uh, you know, get a hold of some, you know, really high level, successful, competitive, driven, uh, athletes who are not just, oh, you know, I want to go to Oklahoma cause they're number one or, oh, you know, I want to go to Florida cause that's where all my friends are that are elite. But they think, okay, you know, what's going to happen in three years or four years? Is it going to be Oklahoma and Florida on top, or is it going to be Cal and, and Georgia and Denver? Mm -hmm. And it just takes a couple of them. It just takes a couple of them, and everything changes very, very quickly. Um, it takes a couple really strong level 10s to develop, to develop within your program. You've seen a lot of teams in the country uh, be very successful by developing their level 10s. And if you look back at Georgia, uh, we had a big combination of both. Um, we had so many national champions that were level 10s, uh, Suzanne Sears, um, uh, Heather McCormick. I, I'm just trying to think of some of them off the top of my head, but we had a lot of really successful. Tiffany, yeah. Yes, Tiffany Tolne. Yes, unbelievable. One of one of our top athletes ever. So um, it's just getting that right mix. And, and of course, recruiting is key. And oh, my gosh, it's so crazy. I'm so glad I'm not coaching right now and having to do the recruiting mess. <laughs> well, how do you think about that? Because there are girls that are committing in seventh and eighth grade. A lot can change. You don't know about injuries, puberty, mm -hmm. who's going to get burned out. I mean, do you feel like a team is going to take five or six years for teams to climb out of a hole now if they don't have recruiting? I mean, how do you assess that? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been in there fighting it, fighting the battle, but um, I do agree that I mean, if I was a parent of a top gymnast right now, I would not let my daughter commit early. Mm -hmm. uh, if she hasn't gone through puberty, I would not let her commit. If she doesn't have any idea of the academic standings of the school, I wouldn't have her commit. If she hadn't spent time with the coaches, I, I mean, I think it's very important. If there's three schools you're interested in, go to their camps, spend time with those coaches, work with those coaches at the camp. Um, yes, they can kid you. And they can. It, it's easy to be a fun camp counselor. It's easier. It's easy to be a great camp coach and teach new skills and, and help these athletes and they'll have a great time and love you. And it might not be the same when you're their head coach, you know, in the program when you are pressured as a coach to be successful and win to keep your job. So, but I think this, these parents are the ones that need to stop it. It's not the coaches that are going to stop it. If the kids want to commit, the coaches are going to still find a way to take them. They're going to find a way to, even though to get these verbal commits, even if they're not posted on social media. Uh, it's got to come from the athletes and the parents who say, I'm, I'm going to have my daughter wait. And I think what's happening now is just the parents are panicking. They see these kids committed and they think, oh, my God, there's not going to be anything left for my daughter. And no, just because she commits doesn't mean it's a guarantee for her anyway. If, you're, if, a do if an athlete commits and she's in ninth grade or eighth grade and she goes through puberty and she's now taller and she's not as good on vaulting as she was in eighth grade, that school might not want her anymore if they want to vault her. 
So I think wait, wait and see, you know, good athletes in eighth grade are going to be, they're going to be great gymnasts in ninth grade. And they're going to be even better in 10th grade. And they're going to have more options later than they're going to have early on. So well, your kids both were athletes. So they both play in college? Yes, they did. So and what, uh, I, yeah. <laughs> what was recruiting like there? Oh, gosh. Well, my daughter, one of my daughter's schools that she was very interested in was Florida. And um, that was in her last three choices. And I encouraged her to stay in the SEC and go to Florida. I think it's a fabulous academic institution. At the time, uh, the Florida team was in the top three in the country consistently over and over. And Allie was uh, one of the top forwards in the state of Georgia. Um, she looked at Vanderbilt, of course. That was one of her top three just because of the education side, the academic side. And Colorado, because uh, she's got just a little bit of that hiker skier girl in her. But I said, you're not going to be doing any of that while you're doing sports. So that doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> I didn't want her to go west of the Mississippi because, you know, I know the statistics of women finding and marrying their husbands in college or staying in the area where their future husbands are going to be living. And in state schools, the majority of the students are from that state. So I was like, I, I don't want you really going to Colorado and ended up living on the West Coast uh, with my grandchildren. So we, we pushed Florida and Vanderbilt and she ended up choosing Vanderbilt. It was a big mistake for her. Um, she never liked it. She never really, it wasn't hard. It, they, they weren't pushing for championships. They weren't, it wasn't that she wanted to go to Florida because they were the top team. And that scared her a little, honestly. She thought, oh, I don't know if I want to go to the top team because what if I don't get to play? So actually Florida, the idea of Florida scared her, but really um, a, a, a little bit lower level than Florida, like a Georgia gymnastics compared to a Florida gymnastics would have been, the Georgia would have been perfect for her because she needed to be at a school that pushed for championships, but wasn't quite there yet. To be at a school where she could help them build uh, and improve and, and really push to be in the finals and the championships. And Vanderbilt was just too low of a level soccer team. And she honestly was bored in a lot of ways. Uh, she played a lot. She got hurt. She transferred to Georgia, sat out a year. You know, you got that transfer rule. And uh, it was funny because three months after she got to Vandy, she goes, Mom, there is no school better than Georgia. There is no athletic department, no strength. and Because she hung around the Coliseum, the segment Coliseum with me her whole life, riding skateboards up and down the Coliseum. She, she knew everyone, and she knew the facilities and the commitment to sports at the University of Georgia, and she wanted to come back to that. So she did, and she got to play her, uh, her junior year and got hurt again, and that was the end of her career. Just a, a very serious uh, avulsion fracture, so that ended her career. What about My your son? son? He's a little more laid back than you, or at least quieter, yeah. yeah. He's laid back. Well, when he was recruited, I was divorced, and he was thinking, money, 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 you know, I don't want my mom to have to pay. And he played tennis, which is not a head count, so you don't get full rides, it was all um, percentages. And he wanted to go to firm, and they offered him a half scholarship. Davison was like a half, and Birmingham Southern offered him a full. And even though it was Division II, he felt like he should go where he got the full ride. And uh, again, it was a big mistake. The level of the team was just not high enough for him. I didn't push him. He wasn't challenged. He was an excellent player. He went in there as the number one player. And um, you know what? He just he found fraternities. He found girls. He just got distracted. And it didn't work out. I wanted him to go to University of Georgia and walk on. And, and you know, the thing is, it's like if you can afford it, and a lot of these state schools pay tuition, like Georgia, you get free tuition. If you can afford to send your child to school, I wish parents wouldn't get hung up on scholarships, you know, just because they can tell their neighbor, my daughter got a scholarship, or they can have it in their local newspaper. Because once you get to school, no one cares. All they care about is who's out on the floor competing. And if you know you're good enough to compete at a school, whether you have a scholarship or not, and you know you can afford to pay, go to the school you want to go to. And that's what I kept telling my son, stay at Georgia. Go to Georgia. And um, if he had, he would have been on a national championship team at Georgia because they won the, the tennis championship that year. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't listen to me, but I hope some parents somewhere do. Well, we don't know much about you as a gymnast. And I wanted to ask you about this because you always skate over this. So how did you actually start in gymnastics, Suzanne? I started in dance. Okay. And tap dance. And I wanted to be a rocket. That was like my all-time goal in life. We lived, you know, just 30 minutes by way of bus from New York. And um, from the time I was 10, I would get on the bus in East Brunswick, New Jersey. And my dad would meet me at the other end at Port of Authority. And I would go to dance class. And, uh, you know, I did that for three years. Uh, and then uh, my flexibility caught up with me. I just couldn't kick high enough to make the rockets with a straight leg. I couldn't kick high enough with a straight leg. 
So I, I went into gymnastics, and um, for those of you out there that follow old timey gymnastics, Ann Burmeister was on my high school team, and uh, she was uh, on the on the world championship team, and I think she was on the Olympic team. I'm not sure, but anyway, she was a year older than me, and um, she married Norm Vexler, who was also a high level, and they were at UMass, and um, but at, in New Jersey, she was always the one that won the state title, and as soon as she graduated, I won the New Jersey state title. So actually, uh, bars was my best and favorite event. Okay. I didn't need to uh, split my legs and have I could have tight hamstrings. I had a little trouble doing pike-ons. I had to do straddle-ons the bar because I couldn't pike-on with straight legs. But um, yeah, I competed all around, and I even have a yearbook to prove it, even though I don't show it anywhere. Because I was your floor routine like Suzanne. I wasn't any good. <laughs> I wasn't well, any good. I, I did a roundup back hamstring back tuck on the wooden floor, and then we finally had a wrestling mat. But I wasn't any good, so I wasn't going to talk about anything that I did. Well, how I did you, loved, we know that you went to Penn State, so... What I did. It, I was recruited by Penn State. Okay. They didn't give scholarships then, but they got me into school. Well, I probably could have got in anyway, but coming from New Jersey, they don't take out-of-state students onto the main campus unless you're in sports. So I went to Penn State for gymnastics, and I don't know, I was probably three months in, and I knew it was just not going to work. Mm -hmm. I can't touch my toes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can't touch my toes. So I went to work at uh, Nittany Gymnastics with Ed Isabel, and that started my coaching career. Okay. Yeah, and, and then I owned my own gym. And how did you know that you were good at coaching? Um, because I just was. Um, I just had success. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't know I was good until I had success, and then I was like, oh, I get this. Mm -hmm. And then I had more success and more success and more success. I don't think you really know until you try it. But um, I own my own gym, Gemini Gymnastics. It's still there in Altoona uh, and um, Altoona, Pennsylvania. And a, a lot of the girls from my original teams are still riding me. One of my gymnasts, Nadine DeLeo, went to Nebraska. And a, a number of them went to college. And um, I was able to coach high-level kids in my club and loved it. And I just loved it. And I did it myself. No men in my gym. I spot, could spot everything. And I just loved it. And then I sold my gym and went to work for Ed Isabel at Woodward Camp running Woodward. Uh, and he convinced me into going into college coaching. So um, when I came to Georgia, I had Gina Bignales and Terry Eckert Smith, uh, both from Nittany and then Gemini, who came came down with me. So had sort of the beginning of a team. Now I wanted to know: you have such a positive and energetic personality. Do you get that from your mom or your dad? Which one do you kind of take after? Probably my dad. My okay. dad. He was Tell a marine. Okay. It was insane. I have three sisters. And, you have to um, explain your personality. Like, where do you get it from? Where really? do you fall in the order, Suzanne? Come on. Okay. okay. Well, a lot of my personality has been developed. I really have to say that. Okay. Believe it or not, I was not always outgoing as much as I am now or as confident. Never. Oh, no, no, no. I was never that confident. Um, I always took risks. I always took risks. I always entered the contest. I always, my parents always encouraged us to do things, to enter things. You know, I was in a diving contest when I'd only been off a board like two times anyway, because I just figured I can watch them do it and I can do it. Um, both of my parents were very encouraging, very supportive to all of us, but I was the tomboy in the family. And so my dad latched on to me. And uh, when I was in seventh, eighth grade, I was a fisherman. I played baseball with my dad in the backyard. We planted gardens. I mean, we did everything together. And he was strict and he was disciplined. And he required that from all of us. And most of my sisters sort of rebelled against it. Instead, I listened to him, and I acquired a lot of discipline from him, a lot. Now, are all of your sisters strong personalities, too? No, I wouldn't say that. No, oh. I mean, one of them's really bossy. I don't think I'm a bossy person. I'm a confident person, but I don't really think I'm bossy. I have a sister that's bossy, but she's the oldest, so she's allowed to be bossy. Um, <laughs> And then I have a sister that's, you know, very, very reserved and doesn't say much at all. She's the one that was the engineer in New Jersey, a mechanical engineer, brilliant, brilliant girl. Um, and then I have a social worker. So she's the, you know, the nurturer one, the one that wants to take care of every wounded bird. There is so, one that looks a lot like you, Suzanne. I think they all, probably a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wanted to know about how you get people to go for it because you're confident, but you're big about going for things and you know, reaching and striving. How do you get people to go for things but not get tight and nervous? Well, Dave, you know, it's a process. Okay, because I'm a perfectionist, Suzanne, so you have to walk me through. Okay. Yeah. 
it, it's a process. Mm -hmm. So when I was coaching, we had Monday meetings mm -hmm. and they were an hour long and we, we planned for them. Jay and, and Doug and I planned for these meetings, uh, you know, what we needed to talk about. They weren't just to go in and tell the girls the schedule or community service or tell them what the workout was. It was team building stuff. And we did it before anyone else was even talking about it. No one was talking about it, not in any sports. I mean, you know, over the last 20 years, everyone's talking about you can't win without team chemistry and we have to do mental training and imagery and breathing and, you know, all these different techniques. But we talked about respect. And every week we had a lesson. And I, I, I did that, wrote the lessons on Sundays. I, ha I always waited until the end of the week so I would get a feel for what the team needed at that time. You never could do them ahead of time. And they were on adversity. They were on divisiveness. They were on, you know, just respect and what does it mean and how do we get it and how do we earn it and how do we build it and how important it is, is respect to success. And we talked through all of the different um, philosophies. Uh, do, do you do gymnastics because you love it? Do you do it for yourself? Do you do it because someone else expects you to do it? Do you do it because it's a job? Are you here because it's a job? Do you feel like this is a job because you're on scholarship or do you feel, are you doing this because you love it? And it's just a benefit that you're, you have money for it. If you had no money, would you still be doing it? All those kind of conversations we had all the time and all of those answers. And we had questionnaires and the girls participated and we did little skits. And we practiced coming in a room and speaking to people that you've never met before. And we practiced, you know, what do you do when somebody turns their back on you? And we did, walked through every scenario possible. We walked through, what if the first person falls off beam? You know, what are we going to do? I mean, we walked through every scenario, but we prepared for, we mainly worked on personalities. We mainly worked on relationships because to me, success is built mainly on relationships. If you can handle that part of coaching. If you can nail that and your athletes can nail that, you're going to win mm -hmm. and define your win. What is your win? And to me, win is reaching your full potential. So um, we spent so much time on this. I mean, we took two hours out of our 20 hours way before anyone else was doing it um, because I, I felt it was important. I just, I knew it was important. And, you know, it was funny because it wasn't till 1996 when I really started doing a lot of speaking engagements after World 95, after we had won three championships, but we started filling up the arena and selling out in 95. Um, and people, Coca-Cola and big companies, uh, Georgia Power would ask me to come and speak at their conferences to like 3,000 people. And they wanted me to speak about, you know, how we built our attendance to 10,000, not just winning championships, but how did you convince people that Georgia could be a place for, you see my dog? Yes. <laughs> He's on my shoulder. Uh, and... I, I sat down, I was like, they said, we want to know your philosophy, how'd you do it? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know because I never read a book to that point. I just went with my intuition. I went with my feelings and I, I learned that I have, I do. I mean, I have a gift of intuition that I can feel when something's right. I can feel when I need to change something. I can feel when someone's not happy. I can see when somebody's discouraged before they even look at me and I just, I have that skill and that is a tremendous skill to have when you're coaching. And then I have a philosophy of giving the athlete what they need. That's my job. That's my job. It's not to mold them to do what I think they should do. It's to give them what they need to be successful, uh, within the confines of, you know, certain, certain boundaries. Um, but those, those Monday meetings, excuse me, those Monday meetings, you could see the team grow through their responses on paper, on questionnaires. I could then um, sort of boister myself forward into what the next week would be, the next concept, so that we could grow on these things. I devised a leadership paper and had everyone score themselves on their own leadership skills. We never had a captain because I don't believe in captains. I think everyone on the team should develop their leadership skills. And when you have a captain, uh, most teams think that's the person that has to speak for everyone else. And I want our freshmen to speak for themselves. I want to teach them to speak for themselves. That is our job to teach life lessons through sport. And teaching leadership skills is something our job, it's our job to do. People aren't born as leaders. They're not born to be a leader. That's a skill that's learned. And that's a skill that can be taught. And so I really, I worked on that. I worked on team building and leadership because you have to have good leadership on any team. And we developed a culture. And, you know, without giving away all of our secrets, it was those Monday meetings. Like, just think about it this way. Um, what's divisive or divisive on any team? You know, uh, 
class, seniors versus freshmen, freshmen in the dorm, seniors or not, who has a boyfriend, who doesn't have a boyfriend, who goes to church every week, who doesn't, who drinks, even though they're not supposed to, and the girls that don't. Those cause the little groups and the little cliques, always the ones that live together are closer together. And so all those things cause, cause divisiveness. So why not talk about it before it even happens? Why not talk about it the very first day with the freshmen? Why not teach them how to avoid those things that are bound to happen if you don't, if you're not proactive? So those are the kinds of things that we did, and that's how you build a team, and that's how you build a team that respect each other. And when you respect each other, you eat dirt for them. You eat dirt for them. You grind it out. You grit it out. You don't wobble. You fight. You go bigger. You go better. You go harder. You stay focused because you're doing it for everyone else. And you have to develop the relationship first. You can't just say, okay, you guys, let's do it for everyone else. It doesn't work that way. So, you know, you have to put in the time and you reap the benefits. Um, now you've coached some gymnasts even over the last years that I would say would be maybe more challenging even than before. I mean, you have Rachel Dixon, who's the most talented gymnast, I think, on the team, not always the most consistent, but you, she did hit at the Nationals the last two years. How did you work to get her to that point to figure out what is the problem? You know, you, Courtney, Josh, yeah, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, Rachel's a classic overload kid. Mm -hmm. You don't overload her. I mean, you're not supposed to overload anyone. And, and I spent a lot of, when I, I didn't mention this, but when I was divorced, you know, you always read relationship books and motivation books and how to get out of your deep hole books. I read all of those books during that period of time and started reading all the athlete books and, you know, Federer's books and all the golfer's books because I feel like golf is, is very much like gymnastics. Um, and I read all of those books and, and I learned a lot about, you know, overloading athletes and giving them too much information. And I found that, you know, coaches really do overload when the coach is nervous, when the coach is anxious, when the coach is disappointed after a meet, they overload. During a meet, because the coach is nervous, they overload. And so I did spend a lot of time with Josh and Jason and Courtney just explaining to them my beliefs on overload and making sure that we didn't do that. Um, and you know, just talking through some different things that I've learned through reading and through my own experience. We did, we had so many meetings together, just talking through things like that and sharing our own experiences. By the way, Jason is amazing. And he, his, uh, what he's brought to the Georgia program is really going to benefit us a great deal. And, and Josh, you know, knowing the youngster and how they develop has been able to bring a lot to the program as well. So Courtney has a really good balance of coaches and they all want to learn and they all want to listen. And they all are sponges. All three of them are reading all the time as well because I told them, read, 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 read. And uh, that's how you learn. And um, so I lost my point of view. I don't know where I'm going. Sorry. <laughs> we were talking that's about Rachel, but who do you see as the leaders? Oh, Rachel emerging? Dixon. Rachel Dixon and Sabrina. I mean, Rachel Dixon is amazing. She's going to be there. She just gets overloaded. And, she, and she not, I'm not saying from coaches necessarily. It can be from too much information from coaches. It can be from the team going, you got this, you got this. It can be from looking around in the fans. It can be because she doesn't close her blinders in. You know, some athletes need to open them up and notice everyone and everything and, and just be embraced by everything. And that's how they are uplifted. And that's how they perform at a higher level is to embrace everything around them. But Rachel needs to close those blinders and be really focused. And so I worked with her on some techniques. Courtney um, asked me and allowed me to spend a little bit of extra time with Rachel on working on some techniques that could help her with that. She understands and knows and recognizes that she she gets anxious, she gets excited, she gets ramped, she um, she gets her adrenaline going, and sometimes it's just too much. Uh, I can remember one of the first times she things she said to me last year in a meet, and she said it again this year, uh, she when she flew off the floor in a double raven, she goes, "I just have too much power," and I I said, "No one has too much power. You don't have too much power. You have to learn the right block angles and the right." You got to harness it the right way. You got to learn those angles and you got to hit those angles and then you won't, you'll just go higher instead of further. And, um, she, she understands the concepts. She just, you know, it's years and years and years of, of breaking some habits. Uh, she loves to twist early. So, you know, just breaking some habits, but, um, she is physically, she's Tiffany Tolney. I mean, she's so fast. She's so quick that, um, you really have to know what you're doing when you're coaching her. Um, because you have to be really specific and you have to just zero in on one or two things. Um, Courtney's got it. I mean, she, you know, again, someone like her, 
uh, she's had, you know, different coaches and this is difficult for her. It's difficult for her, I think, more than anyone else. Um, Sabrina is so adaptable. I mean, Sabrina is just adaptable. You know, she she knows her own gymnastics. She was really high level. I mean, she had Al. I mean, she she knows what she's doing. And um, so adapting to new coaches was really no big deal for Sabrina. Rachel, I think it was a little bit harder. And you have to remember, uh, she had me last year, too. And, you know, I'm sure I'm a little scary and Courtney's a little scary for someone that's already a junior. So, you know, last year was a little bit of an experiment. This year she found her own at, a, at some of the meets. She found her own at, on a lot of in a lot of competitions on one or two events, but never all four did she really hit her full potential. But I see it coming this year. Mm -hmm. Now, how about the underclassmen? Who do you see kind of stepping up? Lucas? Oh, yes. Okay. Lucas for sure. Lucas for sure. She had to, you know, she just had to get into college gymnastics. She's, she's hard, hard on herself. She wants to win, and she's so hard on herself. First thing she ever said to me is, I want to win a championship. And I said, well, you're in the right place because we're going to get one. Um, but she just is so hard on herself. She's got to lighten that up a little bit. Um, and get some better habits, some better discipline in her training habits, which, you know, that's what the first year is finding out, you know, where we have to really zero in. And, and um, she's going to have a lot more discipline in her workouts this year. And I think she'll see a lot more success because of that. How about Bauman? Uh, ESPN loved to show her and her sister, but she actually did better than her sister a couple times when they showed them back to couple back. Times, a couple times. What a worker. Oh, my gosh. She's so intense. She is so intense. She is a really well-trained athlete. She knows her body. She knows her gymnastics. Um, she still struggles with some back problems, you know, which slow her down at times, but she's just going to get better. There's no question about it. We have a great little team next year. It's going to be fun. All right. Well, I want to ask you a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you a couple questions about your opinions. Okay. Okay. Hit me. So there's been a lot. Six up, six count. Five up, five count. Do you like dropping a score? What's your opinion on that? You know, I've always felt like with rules, just y'all vote and decide and tell me, and we'll play them. Mm -hmm. um, I never got real involved in all of that stuff, except for the four on the floor. You know, from the very beginning with Greg, I fought for that and wanted that. Um, but with the five up, I like five up better than six up. I know everybody wants more opportunities for people to compete, but I always make my personal decisions based on fan attendance, television coverage, growth of the sport, uh, and more opportunities for athletes, of course. Uh, and I just, I don't want to change the map. You know, I like 200. I like 49.5, four times makes it 198. You know, you can do it in your head. I know it's a silly reason, but I just think... We, we can't keep losing fans because they can't follow the sport. Mm -hmm. We can't keep losing fans because, you know, they, they, they can't add up the numbers because there's so many places we're still going where you don't even hardly have a scoreboard. And so you're, you're doing it in your head half the time. People are still doing it on little scratch sheets and half the meets you go to. Um, I know some people would say that's silly because if we go six up, six count, you can just have a running score and it would be easier to follow because you're not dropping any. But I say go five up, five count. I like that because the records would have to change. You know that a 198 is the ideal score, and that wouldn't change if you went to five out of five count. I right, like we just that. change some rules so we don't start scoring 199s. We do need to change some rules, but that's okay. How about the difficulty? Because we see a lot of these beam routines that end with a side aerial, back layout full off the end of the beam. You know that Kyla Ross can do a harder dismount than that. You know that Caitlin Ohashi can do something harder And a lot of these gymnasts. Are you a fan of more difficulty? Or do you want to see easy routines so that more schools could be competitive? I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. It doesn't bother me to do a side aerial full or one and a half if they would deduct for, for the athletes whose chest is down on their knees. Um, I don't have a problem, but there's a difference between doing a side aerial full and landing straight up and down and doing one that's squatty and has the chest down. It's stuck. There's a difference. Um, again, this is the argument that we all have every year. In execution, if execution was taken, we wouldn't have a problem. But execution is not taken. So I don't know how you resolve that. I don't think a single skill dismount should be allowed. I don't think a back pike off the end of the beam or a standing gainer should be allowed. I think that should be not allowed mm -hmm. at all. Or it's, you know, it's, it's a, if it, I mean, if you do it, it's just like on bars. If you do a double tuck and you don't have a giant full in ahead of it, it's a deduction. You have to have a certain level of difficulty as a dismount, and I don't think a single skill should get it. Um, on floor, I think we have to do something, you know, with bonus there for sure. Um, on the middle passes, I don't know the answer to that though either, because it, it it's really hard to get dance bonus too. It's really hard to get dance bonus, and if you're an athlete who can't do a full in and you can't do a double Arabian, uh, how are you going to get your bonus if you start taking out 
front full front layouts and back one and a half front layouts. So I don't know the answer to four because I do think we have to keep parity. We do have to make it uh, possible for other teams to um, win championships and be competitive. And upsets were so much fun this year. I mean, everybody loved everybody loved when Auburn beat LSU and Auburn beat us and Auburn. I mean, Auburn, Auburn was beating everyone at the beginning of the year. And uh, it actually put a fear in everyone and gave them a lot of, you know, really fun moments. And I don't think we wanted to lose that from sport. But they're moving the three, the free throw line back in basketball. Okay. So, you know, as we grow and as our athletes improve, we have to make changes and adjustments. Um, I've, I've read a lot of the proposals, you know. I would have to study it to really have a strong opinion. I mean, like, you have to study it. You have to really know it. And many of the coaches that are active right now know it a lot more than I do. Um, I, I do like a single release skill on bars. I think that would be a good improvement to make on, on the requirements, make it a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, how about, do you think about um, athletes going professional and competing in college at the same time? You know, like, should Jordan Weaver have been allowed to compete in the NCAA? Well, that's, the NCAA is never going to allow it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... That's a rule that's far, far, far out of the scope of gymnastics. I mean, they're just, they're not going to allow amateur athletes to compete in the NCAA. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge global, really global, because we have so many foreign athletes now, um, issue that I don't even think it's worth a lot of energy to discuss. Now, I think when these big programs have coaches that retire, it almost feels like there's a hole or there's expectations that it needs to be the same or different. What do you think about... UCLA after Val and Utah after the Marsdens. Do you expect them to be different? Do you expect things to feel different next season? You know, I, first of all, I know it's going to feel different to fans because mm -hmm. I left Georgia. It was like, whoa, it's just, you know, you're used to seeing that same person there all the time. And walking around the community, still living here, it was like, what's going on with gymnastics? What's up? You know, what, what are you doing, coach? What, you know, how's it going to be this year? You're still, you're still in the mix in a small community like this. And the Marsdens, they are Utah gymnastics. Um, it's going to be the same for them. They're going to be asked. They're going to bump into people. It's going to be, you know, I don't know. It's different because they love the mountains. And Greg and Megan will probably go off in the mountains somewhere. But if you're in town a lot, you get dragged back in and you get, you know, it's in your blood your whole life. I found it very hard to just turn my back on it. I just, I couldn't because I, I, I wanted to be part and I missed it so much. Um, and, you know, Val is, is UCLA. I think, I think California will, you know, I mean, they have a similar situation with Chris following Val as I did with Jay Clark. Mm -hmm. And um, it should work. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone that's worked with Val all these years and, and knows how to get a program like UCLA to the top, which is no easy feat, um, he knows it. And um, so you'd think it would just be an easy kind of transition. Um, I think Jay Clark was the right person for Georgia at the time and should have been an easy transition. Uh, you never know what's really going to happen. Um, but I like that he's hired Christina Comforte and he's got a UCLA gymnast back in there. Uh, I think, I think they're both going to move along really well. I mean, they have great assistant coaches that are now head coaches that have been with the programs for a long time. And sometimes I think that's better than completely starting over. Um, Jordan, I mean, she's a name of her own. So, you know, she's going to draw because she's current. She's relative. Uh, relevant. She's uh, in the know. She's in the know, and um, she's gonna. People are gonna be drawn to her because she's like a magnet. So what do you think gonna... about her being twenty three? Do you think it matters? No, mm -hmm. I don't think it matters any more than it mattered that Courtney Coupets had never coached college before. I don't think any of those things matter. I honestly think one of the hardest transitions for coaches is to go from club to college. I still, if I had to choose, I think that's the hardest transition. And if you look around the country, those are a lot of the coaches that have not had success because coaching a club, club kids, elite level, developmental kids, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up to 17 skills, their training is completely different than competing every weekend. And their psyche is so different than a 20 year old and their balance and their day is so totally different than a college gymnast who's now dating. It's so 100% different. I think the club coaches have the biggest transition and the hardest time. Jordan, no. I mean, she's been an athlete. She's done everything. She's been at UCLA. She's worked under the best. Uh, to me, she's another Courtney, just a little younger with a little more coaching experience than Courtney had because we hadn't worked together. So I'd like to see more uh, former athletes out there coaching. Do you think Courtney will hire a volunteer? I don't know. I haven't talked to her about that. 
she's going to be making those decisions with Jason and Josh, her choreography situation, her volunteer coach, her rest of her staff. We have a graduate assistant position open as well. Um, if anybody wants to go to grad school out there and, um, so she's got those positions open. She um, has three amazing freshmen coming in this year. Uh, Soraya Hawthorne actually won floor at JO's this weekend and did a double-double on floor, so we're excited to have her coming in. Haley Dijon from Canada um, is just unbelievable on the bars and, and all the events, really. So And Amanda Cashman also will be coming in from New Jersey. So we have three really strong freshmen coming in. Um, everyone will be returning, Sabrina and Rachel as the seniors, and, and a really strong staff with Josh coming into his third year now and Courtney here third year and Jason. So I, I think, you know, I, I'm a predictor, but George is going to get better. All They're right. going to be better. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Suzanne. I'm sure we'll be checking in with you next year now that you have more that free time and you can speak freely. I will speak freely too. Anything controversial, bring it on. All right. Thank All you right. so much, Suzanne. Bye. All right, Bye. sweetie. Bye-bye.